But let's talk about what HARP uh, can do. As I said, it's a, uh, an array, a field of antennas. And what it, what it essentially started as was 48. Uh, a six in one direction, eight in another direction, and these are 72 feet tall with a cross dipole. So they're a column going up and then a cross dipole going like so. And by firing these antenna in a very specific order, you can focus the radio frequency energy, concentrate it to a relatively small area up in an area above the Earth's surface called the ionosphere. And let me explain sort of where the ionosphere is. You, you've got to look about 30 miles above the Earth's surface for the very beginnings of the ionosphere, and then it stretches out perhaps as far as 400 uh, kilometers uh, out into space and even further in the upper reaches of the ionosphere. And it acts as a, 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 an electrical shield, if you will, a, a, an energized area of our environment so that cosmic radiations coming in from the sun and from space hit this layer and it acts as a filter, filtering out particle streams that would make a life on planet Earth impossible uh, without, um, without this. Now, people talk about ozone depletion as a major issue and it certainly is and we'll cover that in another uh, video in this series. But let's, let's talk about a hole in the ionosphere which would be significantly greater than any problem um, attributed to uh, ozone depletion by comparison because of the kinds of radiation. It wouldn't be just ultraviolet radiation as is the case with ozone. This would be very, very dangerous uh, particle streams that would literally alter the genetic blueprint of the planet. So this is the area that the military is targeting as a research area in the developments of heart. When you look at the ionosphere as this layer around the Earth, and then if you think of the Earth as also um, kind of a giant motor that's spinning around, and with that comes magnetic field lines. And these field lines go from the southern part of the poles all the way up, and they wrap around, they come back in at the northern polar regions. And in these polar regions, where those magnetic field lines interact with the atmosphere and oxygen and nitrogen, you get the aurora borealis, or the northern lights. Or in the southern hemisphere, you get the uh, equivalent of our northern lights. And it's where this energy is interacting with the atmosphere. Well, by using these naturally occurring field lines, you can actually manipulate energy coming off the ground, coming off of a field of antennas like what HARP um, has in Gokana, Alaska, which is just 250 miles uh, northeast of Anchorage. Manipulating weather systems. And this is a very important issue because, again, you're dealing with concepts that have been attempted over the years. In fact, these days, you've actually got the United States Congress um, two bills pending, one in the Senate, one in the House, to create a commission uh, for review of weather modification technology because commercial interests are now advancing them along with um, other militaries from around the world. So you've got economic interest interested as much as the military in controlling weather outcomes and climate outcomes for obvious uh, advantage and reasons. Um, but it creates problems. And here's what happens with HARP. HARP is also capable of, in fact, the early versions were called ionospheric heaters because they literally would heat the ionosphere. And when you think of this area being heated, it's about 30 miles in diameter above the uh, facility itself. And when you heat the area up by, by affecting uh, this region, you literally push it up. So it goes up and out into space, perhaps as far as 200 kilometers. Instead of being 30 uh, miles above the Earth's surface, now you're almost a couple hundred miles potentially out into space with this column and the lower atmosphere below rushes in to fill that space. Now what happens then? You also change uh, pressure systems in the immediate region in terms of uh, lows and highs and the way those pressure systems work and the way in which jet streams flow by altering the flow of jet streams, by altering uh, the way the atmosphere is located within an area, that's where you can get these huge, uh, huge problems. Back in the uh, 1977, the United States ratified a treaty where we agreed to not use um, environmental manipulation as a weapon of war, whether it be to create earthquakes or tidal waves or volcanic eruptions or disturb the weather. Um, all of these things were restricted under that treaty when, when they involved national boundaries or crossing national boundaries. Like most U.S. treaties, um, the exemption is for domestic use. Um, the treaties we sign with all these other countries have a clause within them that allows um, use of the technologies that might be forbidden against another country to be used within the boundaries of your own country. These treaties do not um, have parallel legislation that goes up alongside of them that says, hey, if this, isn't, if this is good enough for our adversaries, it's good enough for us. 
Um, and really, we need that parallel legislation. Every time we sign a treaty, there ought to be a domestic law going right up alongside it. The environmental modification treaties were no exception. Um, the last three secretaries of defense, including the present one, have all called for the abandonment of that um, environmental treaty, primarily because the technologies have advanced to the point where controlling the environment for warfare applications becomes incredibly useful, also for waging covert warfare. The idea of denying a country its rainfall for its agricultural production at the same time you have an embargo ongoing uh, would be uh, the kind of act of war that you could uh, plausibly deny and yet have a devastating effect, even a greater effect than the traditional bombs and bullets. Being able to affect tornadoes. And the idea of tornadoes, you know, you have a warm front coming into contact with a cold front, and when they come together, you shearing force that causes that twisting action where you get the tornado formation. So the idea of Eason was if you could heat the cold front sufficiently that when these two fronts connected, you didn't get that energy differential to create that tornado formation, you could essentially knock out tornadoes. The problem is, of course, if you miss and you heat the already heated area um, so that there's even a greater differential when it encounters the cold front, you have more energy available to create even a more destructive tornado. The fact of the matter is, other governments around the world have taken this very seriously, including our own, and has invested a significant amount of money to look at how to, in, in fact, uh, affect these things. Over the years, HARP has created, you know, quite a lot of controversy. In fact, um, you know, when you look on, if you do a search under HARP, H-A-A-R-P, on the Internet, you'll find thousands and thousands of sources and documents and materials, some of it pretty outrageous, quite frankly, and some of it right on target. Um, like any issue, uh, HARP is no exception. It draws a, a lot of controversy, draws a, a lot of misinformation to the debate as well. You know, this video was prepared to give a summation of the technology, but I recommend highly that people take a look. Get the book from your local library, Angels Don't Play This Harp. There's over 350 sources cited uh, in that book that validate all the things that we've covered today. Take a look. When you're looking at these kinds of issues, big issues that can literally change the face of the planet, um, look deeper. Make sure that the facts are there. Make sure the information is there. But then get that information to those that can make a difference, whether it's your local political leadership coming out of your own states and your own countries. The fact of the matter is these technologies have to be um, engaged in the true light of day. We can't allow militaries to advance technologies that have these kinds of implications for the planet, for our health, for our environment. You know, if we're really to be stewards of this planet, it requires real action. Each of us can do something within our spheres of influence to make a difference, whether it's this issue or any of the other issues we cover in this series. The fact of the matter is people make the difference, people make things change, and we need to engage the processes and do exactly that. And let's let our technology serve us in the 21st century as man uh, intends it to do and not create just another situation that we have to clean up in the next century. Thanks for spending the time with me today. Check out one of our other videos. We've got the mind control video, technologies in the 21st century, and a new video being produced on earth changes. Thanks for being with me.